Deep inside every one of us is a lion waiting to be unleashed. Are you ready to be unleashed into your destiny? As we stand on the edge of time, the web of deception is being unraveled. Carl Joseph offers you the red pill and the keys to unlock the shackles of your mind. Get ready to be transformed by God's supernatural power. Let's join him now. Friend, the title of my message today is this, Have the Courage to Step Out When God Tells You To. Friend, we need to be bold, daring, and resilient in these last days. We should not shrink back, but boldly complete the task God has set before us. Quite often we use the terms gun shy, snake bit, or once bitten twice shy, that kind of thing. These terms perhaps describe our reluctance because of past shame or failure or even humiliation, which causes us to hold back instead of pressing forward with the Lord. We've all experienced times like this, friend, and I know I have. But it's so important that if we experience these failures temporarily, it does not stop us from completing the calling God has placed on our life. We must have courage, friend. We need temerity, gumption, hubris, gallantry, fortitude, grit, guts, or whatever you call it in your parts. Yes, friend, I swallowed a thesaurus there, but you get my point. But where does courage come from if we're to be successful for God? Adrian Rogers, the late great minister from Tennessee, tells the story of a man who bragged that he'd cut off the tail of a man-eating lion with his pocket knife. Asked why he hadn't cut off the lion's head, the man replied, well, someone else had already done that. Oftentimes we exaggerate our stories to make out that we are more courageous than we really are, and we'll be taking time to talk about lions later in the message today. Friend, history repeats itself as time marches on. A study of history shows that great civilizations of the world have averaged about 200 years. The people of the world have followed this timetable, and I'm going to read it for you now. The people go from slavery to faith, from faith to courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to selfishness, from selfishness to apathy, from apathy to dependence, and finally from dependence back to slavery. Friend, let me ask you this. Where is America in this cycle? Are we on the verge of going from selfishness to apathy and perhaps into dependence? But dependence on what exactly? Do you know that right now there are 46 million citizens on food stamps and 96 million people are not currently employed in the workforce? This nation is becoming increasingly reliant upon the government and we need to change that in this generation and the ones to come. It will take courage to do this. Friend, think of the immense courage it took to fight in World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and the tremendous price paid by our courageous veterans to defend the freedoms of our nation. What would that generation think of this selfie generation obsessed with social media and lacking moral decency? I wouldn't want to guess, but I think I could. On the topic of courage, the late Earl J. Fleming, an Alaskan state biologist, was perhaps the only man to objectively investigate the bear's reputation for attacking humans. When Fleming encountered a bear, he neither ran nor shot. At the end of his unique study, he'd encountered 81 brown bears, and although several of them staged mock charges, not one actually attacked. Perhaps we can be braver than we think if we only stand still in the face of our adversaries. But perhaps the statistics would be different for a grizzly bear, right? Maybe. Have the courage, friend, to stand up to the bullying bear who confronts you in this life. Have the courage to stand and above all stand. Don't flee. If that bear is sickness, poverty, cancer, or job loss, stand and have courage because God is for you, not against you. The point I'm trying to get across, friend, is we often overestimate our opponent and underestimate ourselves. As the saying goes, it's not the dog in the fight, but the fight in the dog that really counts. Friend, if there's one takeaway from today's message, that is, I don't want you to underestimate yourself. Why? Because God dwells within you. That's why the kingdom of God is within you. Remember, it was commented in John 7:26 of Jesus' boldness in speech when addressing the elders of Israel. And in Acts 4:13, Peter and John demonstrated boldness also. Let me read that passage for you. 
Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And later on in this chapter it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Friend, if you're full of the Holy Ghost and you spend time in the Word of God and prayer, your boldness will rise. Our boldness comes from our relationship with our Heavenly Father. It does not originate within ourselves. Otherwise, this is presumptive on our part. Friend, have you been with Jesus recently? If so, what evidence do you have? Spending time in his word will make you bolder because you will see yourself as he does instead of looking at your perceived flaws and shortcomings. The same cannot be said for the wicked, however. In Proverbs 28, 1, it says, The wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. The wicked flee, friend, because their consciences condemn them, and consequently they have no confidence. To top that, paranoia sets in, because if you're guilty of some crime or misdemeanor, you'll always be looking over your shoulder. My point is this, there is confidence that comes with a clean conscience and boldness in righteous living. But not everyone in Christ is living this out in reality. Did you know, friend, that a lion's roar can be heard up to five miles away? A lion's roar is so powerful, it's been documented to cause a sudden heart attack in its prey, literally stopping them dead in their tracks. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, friend, but Satan is an imposter, posing as a roaring lion, but he's nothing more than a toothless pussycat as far as believers are concerned. Remember what it says in 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Notice the figure of speech is simile here. He's as a roaring lion, but not an actual lion. The only way he can operate in our lives is if we give him place with legal grounds of hate, unforgiveness, lust, malice, whatever the fleshy manifestation is, we care to grant him. He cannot simply devour us without just cause. And like I said before, he works in one of three ways typically. Number one, ignorance. That's ignorance of God's word. Number two, unbelief. That's knowing God's word but choosing not to believe it. And finally, number three, deception. You know, it's funny. I remember the first time the Lord told me to go pray for someone in hospital. I came in with an expectation that uh, this lady was going to be healed, but she died. I went home feeling sorry for myself as I didn't have enough faith to see her raised from her deathbed. But the Lord reminded me that I had obeyed him when he asked me to go. And this woman is in heaven because of my obedience. I had an expectation to see her raised up, but the Lord sent me there really to usher her into the kingdom of God instead. I am, however, proud of the fact that I went. But friend, if we have the Holy Spirit, the Word, the blood, and a whole bunch of angels on our side, then what excuse do we have to be so timid in this life? Especially when it comes to sharing our faith with friends, colleagues, relatives, or even strangers. But for some reason, we remain tentative, fearing what others might think about us if we do. Friend, God is looking for someone to go into the enemy's camp. I'm going to read you one of my favorite passages right now from 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 3 through 7 in the NLT. And that gives an example of someone going into the enemy's camp. Now there were four men with leprosy sitting at the entrance of the city gates. Why should we sit here waiting to die, they asked each other. We will starve if we just stay here, but with the famine in the city, we will starve if we go back there. We might as well go out and surrender to the Aramean army. If they let us live, so much the better. But if they kill us, we would have died anyway. So at twilight, they set out for the camp of the Arameans. But when they came to the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Aramean army to hear the clatter of speeding chariots and the galloping of horses and the sounds of a great army approaching. The king of Israel has hired the Hittites and Egyptians to attack us, they cried to one another. So they panicked and ran into the night, abandoning their tents, horses, donkeys, and everything else as they fled for their lives. Friend, these men had a death sentence. They had leprosy. But friend, everyone dies. Statistics show that one out of one people die. You're on the clock too. So it's time to make what you do in this world count for something. It's time to go back toward the enemy's camp. Lay aside addiction, pornography, alcoholism, poor self-image, fear, doubt, hate, or whatever else is killing you, friend. Lay aside these sins that so easily beset you today. Rise up and head in the direction God has called you to. 
Friend, it's time to stop running. Just stop running, friend. Face the bully who is pursuing you. It's time to turn around, stare him in the eyes, and begin again to do what God has called you to in this life. Did you notice, friend, in this historical account, as soon as the lepers moved in God's direction, he caused their movements to sound like that of a mighty army. But friend, you too are surrounded by an army of hosts in the unseen realm. I like what Joyce Meyer once said, feel the fear and do it anyway. Friend, fear is not an excuse, but something that may arise occasionally in our lives, but it must be dealt with immediately, otherwise it will fester or even grow. I've also heard the cute acronym that fear can mean false evidence appearing real. And I believe there's some truth to that, because how we perceive things often determines our eventual reality. Now it says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 38, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Friend, these are the words of our Lord. Clearly the Lord takes no pleasure when we shrink back from what he's called us to do. Let me ask you this, what's holding you back in life? Are you still replaying the same mistakes or failures over and over again? I guarantee you that it's the enemy who desires you to replay these events over and over, stopping you from moving forward with God. Friend, these things that have happened to you are giants in your land. Instead of remaining a grasshopper in their sight, you need to delve into God's word and realize just how big your God is. Friend, it's time to get on the offense instead of having a defensive mindset as the lepers did in our passage today. Based on Ephesians 6, the only two offensive weapons we have are prayer and the Word of God. It's time, friend, to turn the tables on your enemy and shoot some arrows in his direction. Remember Jesus' words in Matthew 11, 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Friend, we are the violent in this passage, and few realize this. We're not talking about being violent in fisticuffs. We're talking about being strong in the authority that Christ gave us. If you still feel ashamed for something you've done years ago and can't shake it off, go to the Father today. He took your shame on the cross. God is a God of second chances, friend, a God of third, fourth, and fifth chances, and so on. Remember Romans 11.29 says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Friend, God's not taking your calling back no matter what's happened. He hasn't forgotten what he called you to do on this earth, even if you have. The gifts and anointing to complete your calling is still available today, friend. Please don't waste any more time licking your wounds. It's time to rise up, dust yourself off, and end Enter into what God has for you. Now there's a quick poem I stumbled across by Louisa Tarkington, who was the wife of a famous playwright. And it's really about regret. Let me read it to you. It's called A Wonderful Place. I wish there was some wonderful place called the land of beginning again, where all of our past mistakes and heartaches and all of our poor selfish grief could be dropped like a shabby old coat at the door and never be put on again. Oh, friend, if I could only go back in time and tell Louisa there is a wonderful place and it's called the blood of Jesus. His blood is so vast, it fills the sea of forgetfulness. Why not dive in right now, friend, and start all over again? Hang up that old coat and put on the robe of righteousness instead. Only the devil and other people will remember your sins in this life, but God won't. The good news is when you die and go to heaven, you won't have to give an account to other people, but God only. You've been listening to Carl Joseph and the Lions Unchained podcast. Carl is a minister who's witnessed God's supernatural power to save, heal, and deliver. Carl is a unique researcher who investigates current affairs, societal trends, technology, cults, and end-time events, all through a biblical lens. Every Monday, new podcasts are uploaded, so stay tuned for the next opportunity to roar into victory. Check out carljosephministries.com for exciting articles, teachings, and discussion points. See you next week, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button 